All right, in this video, we're going to study kernels and prove some properties about kernels of homomorphisms. So first off, given a group homomorphism between two groups, from G to H, the kernel of phi is the set of elements in the domain such that their image of that element is the identity in the codomain. So phi of g equals e. In other words, it's the pre-image of the identity element. So we saw as a property of homomorphisms that pre-images of subgroups are subgroups. So the kernel is a subgroup of g. Not only that, pre-images of normal subgroups are normal subgroups. So the kernel is a normal subgroup of g. Now, an example of a kernel you've actually seen before in linear algebra is the null space of a matrix. So given two vector spaces, r to the n, r to the m, and an n by m matrix, there's a linear transformation from r to the n to r to the m given by matrix multiplication. Given a vector v, you multiply it by a. You can check that the kernel would be those vectors with the feature that phi of v is the identity element. The identity element in r to the m is the zero vector. In our case, phi of v is defined to be a times v. And so then this is the definition of null space in linear algebra. So this is just a generalization of the null space. And so kernels of homomorphisms are normal subgroups. And they're generalizations of null spaces of matrices. A natural question you might ask then is given a normal subgroup, is it the kernel of some homomorphism? And the answer turns out to be yes. Given any normal subgroup, there exists another group H and a homomorphism such that N is the kernel. So normal subgroups are kernels of homomorphisms, and kernels of homomorphisms are normal. And here is how you construct H. H is just the quotient group. So let N be a normal subgroup. Take this quotient group. The correct homomorphism, or one choice of homomorphism, is this one. Phi goes from G to G mod N by taking a group element and sending it to its coset. This is a surjective homomorphism. It's referred to as the canonical projection. So in vector spaces, this would be the concept of projecting. Uh, this is a generalization of the notion of projection for vector spaces. Here's the proof that it is a homomorphism given two group elements, g and g prime. Phi of g times g prime, by definition, is g, g the coset of g times g prime. By definition of multiplication of cosets, that is the product of the cosets g n and g prime n. But we see that this is the image of phi of g, and this coset is the image of phi of g prime. And so we do see that the multiplication operation is preserved, and so phi is a homomorphism. Moreover, this canonical projection map is actually surjective. If you take any coset, it has a coset representative. Take any element in this coset, then phi of x is sent to the coset with coset representative x. Because x is in this coset, by properties of cosets, these two cosets are equal. And so you do, in fact, get every coset is the image of some element under this function. Moreover, the important property we wanted, n is, in fact, the kernel of this homomorphism. Why is that? Because the kernel is the set of elements that are mapped to the identity. What's the definition of phi of g? It sends g to its coset. And what is the identity in this quotient group? It's the coset n. So we're looking at all elements in g's that g n is equal to n. 
Again, properties of cosets. These two cosets are equal if and only if G is an element of M. So you're looking for all elements in the group, so that G is in N. N is a subgroup. This set is N itself. So this is the canonical projection, and this is its main property. It's not the only homomorphism with this property, but it's going to be the only one up to isomorphism that's surjective like this. So this illustrates the importance of uh, normal subgroups. They're always kernels of homomorphisms and quotient groups. They're the codomains of this construction. Another property of group homomorphisms that I always liked, this one is not in the textbook, but we're going to state it because I actually like using it in proofs, is the following. There's an equivalent condition for being injective for group homomorphism. If you have a group homomorphism, then a ho your homomorphism is injective if and only if the kernel is the trivial subgroup. And the reason why I like that is because in the usual injectivity proof, what do you have to do? You have to suppose you have two elements in your domain, such that phi of g is equal to phi of g prime, and then you have to try to argue that g is equal to g prime. It turns out trying to show this equality of sets is actually much easier. One reason is because since you have a group homomorphism, phi of the identity is always the identity. So one of the inclusions of sets is already true, always, for any group homomorphism. So you only have to show the other inclusion. And so to show the other inclusion, all you have to do is take an element in the kernel and show it belongs in this set. This set only has one element. So what do we actually prove in practice? What is my punchline? If you already know you have a homomorphism, then to show it's injective, the only thing we ever prove is this statement. You suppose phi of g is the identity, and you prove g is the identity. It's a shorter proof because you have one less variable running around. You're not working with two quantified symbols. You're only working with one and the identity, which is this special element. So it usually makes the arguments go a lot quicker. So I usually tend to use this result when I'm proving that I have an isomorphism. I show the homomorphism property first, I use this to prove injectivity, and then I prove surjectivity some other way. Okay, so let's prove this result. Suppose phi is injective. Let g be an element in the kernel. Again, remember, I only need to prove, take an element in the kernel and prove that it's actually the identity element. What do I know? I know that phi of g, since it's in the kernel, is equal to e. I also know phi of e is equal to e, because that's one of the properties of group homomorphisms. Well, since phi is injective, I have phi of g is equal to phi of e, so g is equal to e. Congratulations, I have the kernel of the homomorphism is a subset of the trivial subgroup. And like I already pointed out, you already have the other inclusion. And so we have equality. So if you're injective, your kernel is the trivial subgroup. All right, let's suppose the other direction. Suppose your kernel is the trivial subgroup. Now suppose phi of g is equal to phi of h for some g and h. You want to prove g is equal to h. Well, move phi of h to the other side by inverting it, and then you have phi of g times phi of h inverse is equal to the identity. By properties of group homomorphisms, phi of g times phi of h inverse is equal to phi of g times h inverse. So we see phi maps g h inverse to the identity. So by definition of kernel, that means g times h inverse is in the kernel. We're assuming that the kernel is the trivial subgroup. So this means that g h inverse is equal to the identity. 
move the h inverse to the other side by multiplying both sides by h, and we see that g is equal to h. So phi is injective. This last claim is extra. Uh, it doesn't actually serve a whole lot of use, although I'll state, use it, mention it again when we cover the isomorphism theorems. This popped up because students have often asked, why is the kernel so uh, important? And I was drawing an analogy to null spaces of matrices and why we care about null spaces of matrices in the context of solving equations. And this same I, uh, feature pops up with group homomorphisms. So here's an interesting fact. Suppose you have a group homomorphism. Let y be an element in H. Suppose you want to solve the equation phi of x equals y. So you're looking for all elements in the group such that phi of x equals y. It's a common problem in mathematics. Solve f of x equals y. y is given to you. You want to find x. The claim here is if you can find at least one solution to this equation, suppose there exists a g, such that phi of g equals y, then you can actually find all solutions. Why? Because the set of all solutions is a coset. It's g times the kernel. So that's the importance of the kernel. And this also brings up the importance of cosets. And so you've already seen this in linear algebra. depending on your instructor, when you solve ax equals b. What you really do is you first solve ax equals 0 sometimes. That's one approach, which means you're actually looking for the kernel or the null space. At least this is on the theory side. And then you just try to find one solution. And then it turns out one of the theorems is that all solutions are of the form v plus the null space of a, which is a coset. So it's the same idea generalized. Of course, depending on how long it's been since you've taken linear algebra, you might not see it this way because it turns out that in terms of algorithms, it's possible to combine these two steps into one and you just do Gaussian elimination and you're doing both steps at the same time. But when you look at the proofs, the proofs have to separate them in the background to actually make this claim. So here we will make this claim. I want to claim this equality. Let me first show inclusion one direction. So I'm going to take a solution to my equation, show it's an element in this coset. So suppose phi of x is equal to y. Then y, since y is equal to phi of g, it follows that phi of x is equal to phi of g. I'm going to do a lot of the same tricks I was using in the previous proof. I'm going to move phi of g to the other side by inverting it. Then e is equal to phi of x times phi of g inverse. Since phi is a homomorphism, that's phi of x g inverse. That means that x g inverse is in the kernel. By properties of cosets, that means the coset x kernel is equal to the coset g kernel. This also means that x is in this coset. So we get the inclusion one direction. On the other hand, if you take an element in the kernel, I mean in this coset, g times the kernel, then this element x has to factor as g times an element k that's in the kernel. Phi of x is equal to phi of g times k. Since phi is a homomorphism, that's equal to phi of g times phi of k. Since k is in the kernel, phi of k is the identity. Identity times anything is phi of g. By definition, phi of g is y. So congratulations, phi of x is equal to y, so x is a solution to this equation. 
So we took something in this coset, we found its solution to this equation, we took a solution to this equation, found it belonged to this coset. So they're actually the same set. And yes, this actually is the same proof in linear algebra. The only difference here is we're working with multiplication instead of addition, and we're not assuming that it's commutative. So order matters. So we had to be a little more careful.